China is back from the dead. Forget everything I said yesterday about problems in Asia. The Chinese economy reopening is booming. It is going swimmingly. Best in a long time. So says the recent numbers from the Chinese Communist government. They reported, the National Bureau of Statistics over there reported the PMIs for the month of February 2023, and they were just blistering. They were amazing, awesome. There aren't enough superlatives in English or Mandarin to describe just how well China's economy is going. By the numbers, the manufacturing PMI put out by the NBS yesterday for the month of uh, February, 526 Well, that doesn't sound very high, and it's not. That's the highest in a decade. You have to go back to April of 2012's 53.3 to see anything better. That just edges out September's 2017, not very high, 52.4. So best number in over a decade. The production index, 56.7, way up from last month. New orders, 54.1 for manufacturers. That's also the highest since April of 2012. And new export orders, 52.4, not very high. That's booming, apparently. That's another big improvement over the last couple of months. China's economy in manufacturing has come flying back to life, says most people. Non-manufacturing. Non-manufacturing, not as much superlative because it was 56.3, and that's higher than anything recently, except it's not only the highest since March of 2021. The new orders index of 55.8, also the highest since March of 2021. The production component for both manufacturing and non-manufacturing give us the composite or the general output of 56.4, which is the highest in the data that I have because I don't think it goes back that far, just beats out September 2017. So the highest in a long time for manufacturing, the highest in a couple years for non-manufacturing, the highest in rec- on record for the general output PMIs, China is booming. And we can, uh, the Chinese government says so too. The NBS, uh, their their spokesman, Zhou Qinghi, said in February, the effects of policies and measures to stabilize the economy further emerged, combined with favorable factors, such as the fading Im- impact of the epidemic, the resumption of work and production of enterprises, the resumption of businesses and the resumption of market accelerated. I don't know what that means. And the level of China's economic prosperity continued to pick up. It all sounds so great, and Western media, of course, has embraced it. China is back to business, and things are booming. Or are they? That's what we're going to talk about today, as well as the ISM manufacturing in the U.S., which spooked some people because of a particular component. But first, I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. As always... If you're interested, Eurodollar University memberships available, background details, the monetary system, plumbing, history, all that great stuff, the basics available at eurodollar.university, as is the Eurodollar University's deep daily deep dive analysis where we dive deep into China, into Europe, into money and curves and all of the macroeconomic implications of everything around us. That's at Eurodollar University too. A daily briefing I do partnership with Markets Insider Pro, where we're going to go over. I guarantee you today there'll be lots about the enough of a briefing on China, the ISM, whatever's happening that particular day in terms of macroeconomic economy, economic details, as well as what's moving market curves and, and the like. All of the information available, eurodollar.university. So we need to talk about PMIs. That's where we need to begin today because I think there's a lot of confusion about what PMIs tell us. A number of such as the uh, MBS manufacturing, 52.6. What does that actually mean? Well, technically speaking, it is the highest in over a decade going back to April of 2012. But what does it actually mean? All it means is that there was a very small number of, re- of, of sample respondents telling the Chinese government they're seeing more activity or more activity in terms of the individual components. So if it's production, then more, a little bit more 
a few more respondents are seeing production than are seeing declines in production. If it's new orders, a few more respondents are saying they see an increase in new orders than a decrease. And it might even be just a very narrow number because there's also a lot of respondents who say we don't see any change from last month. So if the economy is growing relatively steady and you see a PMA around 50 or just above 50, what that tells you is that the economy, generally speaking, because these are not precise numbers, these are not precise measures, the economy, generally speaking, is sticking around to trend. No major deviations. That's why when you see in a truly booming period, PMIs will get up much higher into the higher 50s and 60s because more respondents are saying, we're seeing much better conditions in these individual parts, whether it's new orders, employment, production, new export orders, whatever it might be. In combination, more respondents are seeing more improvement when PMIs get much higher. Around 50, even as the manufacturing number is, all that really tells you is it's a maybe a tiny improvement from where things stood previously. And that's really the key here, where things stood previously, because these are relative measures. If you're coming off a very sharp low, such as when the economy has been locked down, and you see a 52.4, what you're really saying is, well, at least it's not it's not still getting bad. It's it's what which, what 52.4 instead is telling you is that maybe you're getting toward the bottom. And it's not even it's not even necessarily a guarantee at that point either because only a few more respondents are saying they're seeing a pickup than are they're saying they're not seeing it. So if you're if you're coming out of a deep downturn, 52.4 isn't necessarily a great number. And the reason why it's the highest in a decade for China manufacturing is because that's how pitiful China manufacturing has been for all this time. What it's really telling you, and we, you know, we did this just a couple years ago. And by me, I mean, I'm speaking in very general terms. When China, got, when China went into the 2020 lockdowns and then the global economic recession, unnecessary as it was, China came back from that that from 2020 lows and the PMIs got not, you know, manufacturing got a, almost as high as it, it is now. The non-manufacturing obviously got higher and everybody was enthusiastic about how great it seemed that China was going to lead the world out of the economic doldrums of 2020. But when you looked at those PMI numbers, as you look at them today and you put them in this proper context, what it all it told you was, China was no longer falling like the rest of the world, and it was beginning to come up off a trough. But those low-level PMIs that never really got all that high, all that suggested was they're slowly coming back from the bottom. Not that they were rapidly coming back or that the, the economy was anywhere close to booming, because these, again, are relative indications. So when we look at China's non-manufacturing PMI for February that has only matched the previous peak in March of 2021, we're already in that same territory. In fact, you don't have to take my word for it. Um, we also see that the percentage of manufacturing and service sector companies that reflected a lack of orders in the survey has decreased compared with last month, but still exceeds 50%, 50% indicating that the problem of insufficient market demand is still prominent and the foundation of China's recovery still needs to be strengthened and the subsequent trend of the purchasing manager index needs to be further observed. Notice what he's saying here, that in the, the, the uh, non-manufacturing PMI, the, the um, number of those who think the uh, decrease in new orders still exceeds half the survey. And the only reason the new orders index went above 50 was because the number of those saying that they're seeing decreasing orders decreased, but it's still a large number because China is still coming back from a very low and it's coming back relatively slowly. If China was truly coming back in a rapid fashion, in a truly rapid fashion, we wouldn't see PMIs in the low to mid fifties, 
we would see them in the low to mid 60s, as we once did uh, not that long ago. Well, over a decade ago, but within memory, at least the, I think the memory that most people have of the Chinese economy when they were committed to expansion pre 19th Party Congress, when we did see PMIs get up that high because it was legitimate economic recovery and expansion, unlike what we're seeing now, where these numbers are just telling us about relative changes off or near the bottom of downturns. So 52.4, whatever the number is, 52.6 manufacturing, 56.3 non-manufacturing. When you put them in the context, you understand what PMIs are telling us. They're saying that, yes, China's economy is not as bad as it was at the end of last year, which is exactly surprising to nobody. We knew that reopening was going to produce some, some kind of bounce in China's economy, but how we reconcile that lack of bounce or what must be a lack of bounce with these PMI numbers and to all of the stuff I've talked about previously, including the Baltic dry number, the export numbers from Japan, which are probably going to get a little bit better than they were in January. What that means is, again, China's economy fell down and reopening is just reopening. That's all it is. It's not a legitimate economic boom. It's not a major acceleration. It's not the world saving, save us from recession type of activity or increase in acceleration in activity that everybody's looking for. You have to put these PMIs in perspective. In one sense, what we're seeing out of those from China is exactly the way that those other indications have said. China's economy went way down and it's kind of hanging out at way down. Internally, there's some improvement, as, as he said, as um, resumption in activity, resumption of work and production of enterprises. That's why you see the non-manufacturing PMI higher than the manufacturing PMI, which is constrained in a good part by global demand. We also got the PMI, the big one, the granddaddy of all PMIs, the ISMs for the United States for the month of February. And it was basically unchanged from the shocking low in January. So the headline was 47.7 versus 47.4. So basically unchanged, not much of an improvement there. There was an improvement in new orders, but again, these things are all relative. From the real bad low of 42.5, in January, new orders index in February was 47. So still contracting, but not as not as many are saying there's, that it's contracting or as bad as, of a contraction as it was in the previous month of January. The employment number, if you care, 49.1 versus 50.6. That certainly doesn't mean that mass layoffs are happening. In fact, uh, the ISM's press release noted how Quote, new order rates remain sluggish due to buyer and supplier disagreements regarding price levels and delivery lead times. The index increase suggests progress in February, but not really relative. Panelist companies continue to attempt to maintain headcount levels through the projected slow first half of the year in preparation for a stronger performance in the second half. That part is every recession we, we see and document uh, throughout post-war economic history, especially in the United States. Companies do not want to reduce employment until they absolutely have to. They maintain the most optimistic viewpoint until it, until it becomes too late. They will cut back on hiring. They might reduce some hours, but they don't want to get rid of workers because they're always looking for the second half rebound. There's always a second half rebound until that point in which they realize there actually isn't. And when that realization begins to set in, that's when the mass layoffs start. So we've seen that happen in very small scale fashion in the technology industry, last couple last couple months of last year and begin this year, but it hasn't yet been triggered in widespread fashion, in large part because, like a lot of recessions, they don't necessarily look or feel like recessions in the initial stages. As I went through in a recent video, you look at it from the perspective of payroll reports, the payroll reports can look solid because 
hiring and employment can remain relatively stable even as contraction has set in throughout the general economy. We see this in lots of different uh, business cycles, including 2008 to a certain extent, using at least the initial uh, data survey. We see that in prior recessions, as Mike in Canada mentioned, 1974's recession, which was really nasty, but the first part of that recession looked relatively decent from the perspective of the, of the labor market. And that's the reason, because headcount, the companies continue to attempt to maintain headcount levels through the projected slow first half. They'll hold on to employees even through a slowdown, at least until they realize it's not just a temporary slowdown, it's something more severe. And the thing is, we cannot tell ahead of time what is that specific trigger? What is it that says to one company that the second half rebound isn't going to happen and, the, and to another company it might be a different thing? What is it that, what are these potential triggers that to very different companies throughout the economy, they finally give, throw in the towel on the second half rebound? Because that's the one common factor, or at least one of the, one of the main common factors in all of these business cycles is the idea of a second half rebound. And when you look at um, something like China's PMIs, for example, you might think, hey, that PMI number over in China looks pretty good. Maybe there really will be a second half rebound in the United States and the global economy. So we'll wait to see if numbers and orders and effort pick activity actually does pick up in the months ahead. But then if the activity does not actually pick up in the months ahead, as markets all expect, that's when the final phase of recession actually hits. Layoffs are not the first phase of recession or not the fullest extent of recession. They're the last part. But the number which really got markets spooked today wasn't the low headline of the PMI, which is consistent with recession in the United States, it was the prices paid component, or just I think they just call it the prices component for the ASM. It had been 39.4 two months ago, so that was December, which was consistent with what Jay Powell said about disinflation in the goods economy. In January, it ticked up to 44 and a half, so still seeming more saying that they're seeing prices go down than go up, which was consistent with you know gasoline prices and some modest price increases in a certain categories. But in February, the just released number today, the prices component went up to 51.3, which supposedly means reinflation all throughout the economy. When, again, remembering what PMIs tell us, something relative to what just happened. We had prices coming down and 51.3 suggests at best maybe prices have stabilized. Whether that's a short run stabilization or something longer term remains to be seen, but it doesn't mean prices are accelerating upward again. It just means that a few more respondents said they're seeing prices go up than we're saying the they saw prices go down last month. And that's the message here for this video, that PMIs, these indexes are always relative. And so low 50s, doesn't mean a boom, even if it's the biggest low 50 in over a decade. It just means that they were reasonably sure that in the context of a slowdown or downturn, that maybe the, the near-term bottom may have been reached. But that's not the same thing as China going, China rebounding or recovering or booming, nor is it the same thing of, uh, as re, uh, China's reopening being all that much to begin with. PMI's relative measures. I'm Jeff. This is Eurodollar University. Thank you very much for joining me. As always, huge thank you to Eurodollar University subscribers, the research subscribers, as well as our generous Eurodollar University members. Until next time, take care.